want to turn this evening, please, uh, to the book of John, John's Gospel, and we're in chapter 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, and we're going to commence our reading in verse 20. It's really just four, four or five verses in the middle of the chapter. John's Gospel, chapter 12. <coughs> Again, let me just thank you for being here this evening. It's good to gather under the sound of the Word of God. John's Gospel, chapter 12, then we're in verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered him, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit." Just those few verses, and as always, we just trust that the Lord's word would be blessed to every heart tonight for his name's sake and for his glory. Friends, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ is full of incidents where people came to see him. We have looked at this portion of scripture before, I know we have, but it's full of incidents where various people came to see him. Wherever he went, there were always those who wanted some kind of an audience with him, if that's the right word to use. They came for many reasons. Some came, for example, out of simple curiosity. We have that in this chapter and back in verse 9 of the chapter. It says that many came not for Jesus' sake. Only let me read that to you. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. They came because of what Jesus had done. You know that story, Lazarus had just been raised from the dead four days in the tomb, and Jesus brought him back to life. What a miracle that was, and what a wonder it produced in the minds and in the hearts of the people. And it brought people to see Jesus out of simple curiosity. And to see Lazarus because of what he had done. By the way, we've had the opportunity, uh, God willing, it will be next year, but we've had an opportunity to have a man from America who'll be in Northern Ireland for a fortnight next June, and he was dead for an hour and three quarters. Carries his medical certificates and all with him to prove that, died in the operating theatre, on the operating table, rather, in theatre, and we have the opportunity to have him a Sunday evening next June. So we're looking into that uh, to test him out and so on to see what that's all about. But he has a story to tell. You can pull him. His name is Dean Braxton. No relation to our Dean uh, because his colour is completely different to start with. <laughs> but uh, Dean Braxton's his name. If you want to check him out on YouTube, you'll hear something about him or you'll see some of the interviews that he has done. Certainly seems to be very, very authentic. As I say, he carries all of the medical certificates and documents to prove exactly what happened to him. And he claims he was dead for an hour and three quarters and was in heaven before he was sent back again. So we're looking to that and we're testing that out just to see what's there. But the opportunity is there and God willing, that would be next, uh, next June. But can you imagine, you know, what it would be like in a situation like that? Because that's what happened with Lazarus. Four days dead. And Jesus brings him back to life. It's little wonder that people came to see him. And little wonder that people, you know, were curious about both him and the Lord Jesus Christ, who could do such a tremendous miracle. And so some came out of curiosity. But then there were others who came for worldly advantage. They came for what they could get from him. We see this in the loaves and the fishes. Let me read you a few verses from John's Gospel, chapter 6. After the loaves and the fishes, in John 6, verse 26, Jesus said on that occasion, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. 
And there were those who would have come to Jesus to see him, to see what he was doing, in the hope that they would receive something from him. There were others who came because of soul distress. We can think of, of, of the woman in the Pharisee's house. Let me read you a few verses from Luke chapter 7. Verses 37 and 38 says, She was a woman of the city, a sinner. And she brought the alabaster box of ointment and wept and washed his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair and anointed them with the ointment. She was a soul in distress, called simply a woman of the city, a sinner. What she realized, there was holiness, there was purity, there was righteousness, there was something about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in distress of soul, she comes to him on that occasion in the Pharisee's house. And Jesus said to her, thy sins are forgiven. You see, folks, there, there, there are many reasons why people were attracted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this evening, as we gather here, there are perhaps different reasons among us too. You see, you could be here perhaps this evening in need. Perhaps you're looking to him. Just being in the house of the Lord. Just being in, being in the place where the Spirit of God moves amongst his people. And today you could be here this evening, that's some kind of need, and you're looking on to him to sort out that need, to sort out that problem. Maybe to touch you, or maybe to sort out that difficulty, or to take away that pain, or to help you with that temptation, whatever it might be, because there might be need there. Touch you and heal you, make you feel whole, or to give you perhaps wisdom. Maybe you're looking for guidance or for something like that. Trusting that the Lord somehow will drop something into your heart and into your experience. There are many reasons why people come to the house of the Lord. Maybe some of the younger people among us can perhaps, here maybe perhaps wanting him to help you looking to school. You know, one of the mornings at Holiday Bible Club, uh, Jonathan asked the children who would be uh, moving to secondary school this September, making that move from primary into secondary school, he asked them to stand. And a number of young people stood up amongst the gathering. And of course, we, we prayed for them that the Lord's hand would be upon them. Maybe some young person here tonight, and that's your situation, making some kind of a move, something that lies ahead of you, whether it be a new school or perhaps something else. And you're looking to the Lord for help and for guidance and for blessing in all of that. So there were many people who came looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many people who come to church services looking for the Lord in various ways. Maybe, as I've said, it's maybe a word from God that you're looking for this evening. You know, it's probably true to say that every single one of us are wanting something from the Lord. Now, that's not, of course, why we're perhaps in this service this evening. But nonetheless, we are wanting something from Him. Something in our experience or something, you know, in, in our hearts or something just in our day-to-day -day living. Because we all have needs and we're looking unto Him. But you know, this evening, wouldn't it be great if for a time we could leave all of that stuff to the side? Whatever those needs might be, whatever those wants, whatever those wishes might be, just leave it all to the side. Just lay it all down and step away from it and just focus on Jesus. Just focus on Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. Folks, just to focus upon him. Let me say tonight, that's hard to do. It's difficult to lay aside everything and make the time just to focus upon the Lord. We touched on some of this this morning. As we thought about the power of God and, and obtaining and receiving a, a, a more of the power of God in our hearts and lives, we talked about how we need separation and sanctification, times to get alone with Jesus, shutting out the noise of the world that's all around us. It's so difficult to do that. And you know, sometimes we sing about those things, but in reality, they are hard to do. We sing that little chorus, don't we? Let's forget about ourselves. Concentrate on him and worship him. And it sounds so good to sing. But do we really master that in our own experience? Because that can be so hard to do. 
And yet, you know, if we could just do that, we would find in the Lord Jesus Christ all that we would ever stand in need of. If we could just reach out to him, if we could just fully focus upon him for who he is, not so much for his power, not so much for his blessing, not for anything that we can really get, get from him, not because we are in need, but just reach out to him. I want to tell you tonight, then every need could be met. We could receive from him as we see him for who he is. He would impart into our souls and into our lives everything we need. You see, we need to get our eyes off whatever it is. You could be sitting here tonight even under the sound of my voice like a lot of people do a lot of the time and your mind could be everywhere. Isn't that right? I've sat in meetings and done the same. You're okay. You can, you, you're in the Lord's house. You can be honest about it. Because sometimes it can be so difficult to focus upon what we're looking at. And you're in there and the next thing your mind's wandering. Maybe you think, could think me thinking about perhaps tomorrow. Maybe you're thinking about something that happened yesterday. What I'm trying to say is it's so difficult to really forget about ourselves and concentrate on him and worship him. Our whole lives, our whole, look, our whole outlook, our whole experience can change if we can touch Jesus with our hearts. If we can touch him and focus upon him. We sing a little chorus sometimes. It's all found in you, Jesus. It's all found in you. All I desire, all I require, it's all found in you. Just look at Jesus for a moment. Just feast upon who he is and what he has done for you. If you're saved tonight, just focus upon what he has done for you at the cross of Calvary. If you're here tonight and perhaps you don't know him as Lord and Savior, just focus upon what he has done at the place called Calvary. Because sometimes we have been so long saved perhaps or we're so accustomed to the gospel being proclaimed. We are so caught up with whatever that we have lost and we have or we lose the, the impact of the stuff in the Bible that is so simple about the cross and about this wonderful Savior. And so take a look at him tonight with me for just a moment or two. In Bethlehem. It's not Christmas time. I think I'm in Christmas because last Tuesday night, that's what we were covering in the book down in the mustard seed. The birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in Bethlehem, we see him. He's the lowly one. The lowly one. The one who came into humble surroundings, not to be served, but to serve. The one who came into humble surroundings, he said he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. And beloved, tonight that was every single one of us. Because we are all lost, or we were all lost. Born in sin, shapen in iniquity, on our road to a lost eternity. But here we see the lowly one who steps out of heaven's glory into that humble, cave, stable, whatever it was. To serve you and to serve me. To save you and to save me. And whether we're saved in this gathering tonight or whether we aren't, we need to allow the truth of that to really touch our souls. He came as a lowly one to serve your need and mine, especially in the realm of sin. And I want to ask you very plainly tonight, have you allowed him to touch your life? As you gaze tonight upon him, have you allowed the truth of the fact that the Son of God came into this world for you and went to the cross of Calvary, have you allowed that to pierce your heart, to touch you through and through? Have you responded to this lowly one? Because I want to say tonight how precious, dear one, how precious you are to him. You are the reason that Jesus came here in the first place. And he is constantly at work speaking to hearts and drawing lives onto himself. And he wants to draw you to himself this evening. Those of us who are saved, he wants to draw us closer to himself. We were thinking of that this morning too. He wants to draw us closer to himself. 
We can move on from Bethlehem. Whenever you look at him in Jerusalem, we see him as a merciful one. In John's Gospel, chapter 7 and 37, Jesus stood and he cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture says, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. receive. Friends, what a mercy that is. He's the merciful one. You and I united unto him. You and I can come unto him. You and I, some of us have already done this, but you and I can come with our sin. And what mercy we find whenever we come to this blessed Savior. Many of us can look back to that night. The the hymn writer says, Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me, because there my burdened soul found liberty. Calvary. And if you don't know that tonight, you can do that. You can come to him. You can receive that mercy. You can experience that grace. You can know the touch of God deep down in your heart and in your soul. Because that's what Jesus is all about. He's merciful. And he puts his spirit within us. He doesn't just do something for us, but he he comes to dwell. He comes to live within our very being. He is not just with us. He is in us. In John chapter 14 and 17, you take and read sometime John 14, John 15, and John 16. Read it again with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in mind. What a chapter, what a section those chapters are. That speak about the Holy Spirit. He is in us. He comforts us. He teaches us. He brings what Jesus said to our remembrance. He guides us into truth. He tells us what he hears. Just think of that. He tells us what he hears in heaven. And he brings that into your experience. Into your heart. And into mine. Once he comes to dwell within us. He shows us things to come. He glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He shows us what Jesus has, what glory that there is for you and for me. And here's the invitation. Jesus says tonight, are you thirsty? He says, come. Come. Maybe you're saved tonight. You're thirsting for more. Jesus says, come. Maybe you're unsaved tonight. And you know that in your heart, There's sin that needs to be dealt with. Jesus says, if you're thirsty for forgiveness and mercy, Jesus says, come, come. And he puts within you and me all that we need because he gives us his Holy Spirit. What a blessing. He's a merciful one. Look at him in Gethsemane. Friends, in Gethsemane here we see the the agonizing one. He agonizes. And in an agony it says, Jesus In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, he takes them with him to pray. And it says, Jesus went a little further. I love that. I love that. Because, beloved, Jesus has gone further than anyone else has ever gone. Jesus, with you in mind and with me in mind, he went a little further. And in anguish he prays, and in anguish he seeks after God, and in anguish anguish of soul that says he sweated great drops of blood, as it were, falling to the ground as he prepared himself to face the ultimate of the cross for you and for me. To take our place, to bear that judgment, to bear that punishment for you and for me. For me it was in the garden. He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but praise God he had sweat drops of blood for mine. The agonizing one. Because you are on his heart. Because his love for you is from everlasting to everlasting. You're the object of his affection. And so in Gethsemane, he agonizes as he prepares for the ordeal of the cross that lies before him so that you and I could receive his mercy, so that you and I could be forgiven through the blood that he would shed. And then we move from Gethsemane and we come to the cross. 
And in Matthew chapter 27, it says in verse 36, and sitting down, they watched him there. Take a gaze. Sit where the Roman soldiers sat. Sit where the people who scorned him sat and watch Jesus upon the cross. Dear one tonight, join with that company of people. Sitting down, they watched him there. What did they see? They see a saviour stripped and beaten practically beyond recognition. And there at the cross they see what we call the redeeming one. They mocked him. They reeled on him. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. He saved others himself. He cannot save. How true that was. Because if he had saved himself, then you could not be saved. But he chose. He hung upon that cross at Calvary so that you, dear one, might be saved. That you might be saved. The redeeming one. And yet they sit and they look at him and they can't understand it. They can't really see what's unfolding before them. They can't comprehend that heaven has sent its greatest to meet the greatest need of man and has met at the cross of Calvary. And sitting down, they watch him there. And he's the redeeming one. And with his dying breath, he cries, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's his cry tonight, that you might be forgiven, that you might be brought into this thing that we call salvation, right relationship with this glorious Savior that died upon the cross, giving his all for you and me. Look at him on resurrection Sunday morning. Praise God, we see him there. He's the victorious one. Death could not hold its prey, we sing. Jesus, our Savior. He tore the bars away. Jesus, our Lord. And up from the grave, he arose. Victorious one. The grave couldn't hold him. Death had no claim to him. And you know, he endured what is the climax of every single life that has ever been lived. Death. And yet death had to release him. Death had been crushed. Death had been defeated. And he rose victorious, we say it so often, over sin, over death, and over hell. And the apostle could write, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Friends, I can tell you today, this evening, that whenever you stand at the grave side and a loved one has been laid to rest in Mother Earth, what a glory to know that that loved one had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The sting of death is gone. The victory of the grave is gone. Because you know it's absent from the body and praise God, it is present with the Lord. Hallelujah. And it's all because he is the victorious one. And again we sing that little chorus, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, life is worth living. Why? Because he lives. And praise God, we shall live also if we know him as Lord and Savior. He is the victorious one. And the Apostle Paul in that chapter of 1 Corinthians goes on and he says, Thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, hallelujah tonight. He is glorious and he is completely victorious. And we gather in this building this evening. We gather here. And I believe he wants us to see him for who he is. You could be sitting in our congregation tonight. Perhaps you've, you've never taken a, a, a full focused look at this one who's the son of God but who graced Mother Earth by walking amongst men and who laid his life down upon the cross of Calvary in redemption so that you and I could be forgiven. But let me say it again. Here we see him in Bethlehem. He's the lowly one, the humble beginnings. In Jerusalem, he's the merciful one. He cries out, come. 
In Gethsemane, he's the agonizing one. Agonizing over the cross that lay before him and the souls of men and women and your soul, dear one, as it hung in the balance, as he would face that dreadful thing. We see him upon the cross. He's the redeeming one. He sheds his blood because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. And we see him in resurrection. He's the victorious one. And today, praise God, he's in heaven. And he's the glorified one. Hallelujah. The glorified one. He ever lives, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. He prays for us. If you're saved tonight, he prays for you. He upholds you before the Father in glory. If you're on sea of tonight, he's constantly looking at the cross. He's constantly looking at the sacrifice he has made. He's constantly looking at the price that he has paid so that you can be forgiven. And there in the presence of the Father, he is a constant reminder that the cross is sufficient to cleanse to the uttermost all who come unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Access to the Father through him. And I'm asking you tonight, can you see him? Can you really see this wonderful Savior? I'm asking you tonight, if you're saved, don't you want to be closer to him? Don't you want to be more like him? And I'm asking tonight simply if you're unsaved, don't you see what he has done for you at the place called Calvary? And tonight we simply want to urge you to come. Come to him. Lay down that sin. Lay down that life of self-centeredness. Lay down that life where everything revolves around you. And look to this man that we call Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Look to this wonderful Savior who can change you, I praise God, from the inside out and make you acceptable in the sight of God. Cleanse you from sin and make you ready for heaven and for home. You know, is it any wonder these Greeks come and they say, Sir, we would see Jesus. Because, beloved, whenever you really see him, He transforms lives. He changes attitudes. He shapes crooked hearts. He makes ambitions and desires melt away in the face of the glory and of all that he is. We would see Jesus. And beloved, it's our prayer here this evening that if you don't know him as Lord and Savior, you would see him even now. And that you would embrace him as your own personal saviour and as your own Lord. Will you do that tonight? Will you do that tonight? Because his entire life is an expression of tremendous love. And dear one, it's love for you that brought him to that place. Brought him to the cross and caused him to lay down his life for you. Will you give your life to him tonight? Because he has given his all for you. Let's just bow in a moment's prayer. The hymn writer says, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. What a wonderful Savior to me. Can you say that tonight? Is he your savior? It's our desire that he would be. And so I'm asking you tonight to search your heart. See if you be in the faith. And if you say no to that, you're not in the faith, then why don't you reach out to him right now and just simply ask him to forgive you. Ask him to forgive you. And he will save your soul. If we can help you in any way, we're here to do that. Or maybe if you're reaching out to him in these moments, please tell us about that. But if he's speaking to your heart tonight, don't leave here without getting right with him. He's only a prayer away. Just reach out from your heart and ask him to forgive you and to save you. 
And if you leave it with him and that comes from your heart, praise God, he'll do all the rest and he'll meet with you. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise this evening for this wonderful Savior. And Lord, you know every head that's bowed before you now and we ask that you will just touch us, Lord, in your presence. Praying that your people would be encouraged, that your people would be blessed, that your people would be built up in their most holy faith. And again, asking, Lord, perhaps if any amongst us don't know you as Savior and Lord, that they would come this very evening to put their faith and their trust in you. So bless your word now to all of our hearts, we pray. And Lord, like those of old, we simply reflect again and say, we would see Jesus. Holy Spirit, reveal this wonderful Savior to every heart and life, we pray, for our good and for his name's sake and his glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.